The president roars to a mixed response in Arkansas. Outsourcing, will another attempt to address youth services work? A federal appeals court and Planned Parenthood in Arkansas is the case headed for Washington. But first, a veteran sports journalist assesses the impact of an Arkansas icon. Arkansas Week, next. Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Arkansas Week. We will get to the week's policy news in just a moment. The constant viewer knows that sports isn't usually a topic on Arkansas Week, but this has been a remarkable week in that it marked the passing of an Arkansas icon. And here to join, uh, joining us tonight to talk about his place in Arkansas history, that being J. Frank Broyles, Harry King. Longtime sports columnist, reporter for a half dozen Arkansas news agencies and now writing for the Gatehouse Media. Harry, you've spent a working lifetime in sports journalism in Arkansas. This is not a softball. I'm not lobbing one. Who was Frank Broyles? Visionary. That's the first word that comes to mind. I, it, and, and a unifier of the state. If you, if you think about when he arrived, it was December of 57. If you ask around the country in 57, what about Arkansas? The first thing we'd mention is Central High School. It is. I mean, that's, that's what we were known for back then. I was just barely in high school, uh, but and across the river from Central High, and I, it, it was a terrible time. And yet, Coach Broyles uh, created a spirit of unity somehow. I'm not quite sure how he did it, it, it but by the time by the time he'd been here two or three years, people were, all, were proud to be Arkansas. Before that, it was kind of uh, uh, thank God for Mississippi kind of deal, you know, on, on education, income, and that kind of thing. So, Well, he became, in his time, as head coach of the Razorbacks and then as athletic director. And then as a, after that, as a, uh, a leading light in the Razorback Foundation, he became not just an an athletic figure, but he was a social force, a cultural force, an economic, and one could arguably say even a political force at, at moments. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. I, I think you could check all those boxes. You, you wouldn't be wrong, believe me. There, there were things. He even told somebody way back there, I can remember making that drive to Fayetteville. It was a terrible drive to, to staff a ball game. And he told somebody, there'd be an interstate up here. I mean, he, he made sure that somehow there was an interstate <laughs> up there, how he did it. But, but you think about the people he touched uh, financially that, that got him to give real money, and then he was just as good at getting that little guy to send in $100 or $200, whatever it was, and make them feel like they were really worthwhile. It, it, I'm not sure quite how. Maybe it was that Georgia draw. I don't know. But he, he could do it. Yeah. Well, the idea from the first seemed to be, correct me if I'm wrong, sports isn't, college football is not my beat, but... <laughs> <laughs> his, his vision, if he had one, seemed to be to consolidate the state into behind one major department, one major team. No question. And that was one of the reasons he, he in retrospect, one of the reasons he talked about taking the job is because there was no other competition in the state, no sports team, no other major college, and that's nothing against ASU or, or UALR or anybody else, but, but there wasn't any competition there. And he thought he could do that. And by gosh, he did. And like I said, when he first arrived, I was, uh, you know, this may, may be too personal for you, but I was a St. Louis Cardinals fan. Didn't care anything about college football. Uh, listened to the Cardinals on the radio. They, Arkansas had a good team in 54, but I uh, kind of oblivious to that. And by the time 59, 60 got here, 
I was hanging on the radio on Saturday night listening to the race and, and listening with friends and we'd get so wound up that you had to go outside at halftime and throw the football around because you were listening to, and you <laughs> I mean it's just a, it, the, what he did is remarkable. Do I you, don't mean to have, uh, throw cliches out there but remarkable comes to mind. Do you and uh, this probably should be noted or should be noted as well in a in a time even in the 60s 70s when major infractions in college sports programs were not rare and they may not be rare now. <laughs> But he'll be remembered for running Clean. with, with I guess you could say, correct me if I'm wrong again, but comparatively minor infractions yeah. in the grand scope of things. He ran a clean program. Absolutely. Yeah. And he did that and still won. You know, other people won by doing, SMU and people like that uh, they broke all kinds of rules. But yeah, he did. Uh, I'm not quite sure how he did it. but. If you look at his, his uh, he had a coaching tree before other people had a coaching tree. That's become a popular thing these days. All those coaches that were assistants under him that went on to success other places, amazing. I, I, that's all I, I, it's the only thing I can explain. And the, and the pride in, in being an Arkansan playing for Arkansas. That's where most of the recruiting was back in those days. Arkansas kids, they won with Arkansas kids, East Arkansas particularly. Harry, you mentioned a second ago that uh, that Coach Broyles reached out to the little guy as well as the big spenders, the Stevens and the other, to and to to support the program. <clears throat> Do you think? And of course, it, he was the deciding factor in get in moving Arkansas from the old Southwest into the Southeast Con, the big money conference. Uh, amazing. Go ahead. Do you think he uh, was was satisfied with where the with college football today, the SEC? I mean, there, there would appear to be less and less room for the little guy. The money's just too. Yeah, it is. It is. In fact, I think this is right. In '90, the, the U of A budget was nine million dollars. By the time they got in the SEC, it was forty-nine million dollars. I mean, the money is amazing, and yet people. In, a couple of years ago, the um, study of 350, 360 uh, Division One teams, Arkansas is one of 24 that their budget was balanced. There are not many athletic programs that budget, and, and that was an almost a $100 million budget. And somehow, what he started way back there continues. Yeah, has the little guy been squeezed out? I mean, was he, was he concerned that the, that the season ticket holder, the, the little guy like me, sure. Could get squeezed out in the in the big money of college, uh, SEC. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that that hasn't happened in the last couple of years. Particularly, uh, you know, you got to give a donation, and then you got to pay for tickets on top of donation. It's become more of a uh, entertainment kind of thing where there was that loyalty. You know, you, you'd see guys at War Memorial Stadium that you know spent their last 25 bucks to get in there, and now it's sit behind the glass and criticize, and the whole dynamic of college football, of college athletics, has changed. Everybody well, second guesses. Even. Well, he, and he didn't ignore athletic. I mean, excuse me, academics either. I think I no. can recall him leading a, a campaign for the fate of a library, well, the UA library up there. Yeah, and, and and at some point they started giving money back to the university. They, had, they were doing such so well with the athletic fund that they've actually given a couple million dollars a year back to the university. Harry, so. can there be? Uh, can there be another Frank Broy? Well, all due respect to uh, Director Long and the other staff up there, is there going to be, not just in Arkansas, but anywhere, is no. there going to be another? You got Saban down in Alabama, of course, and some other. But it's a pretty mobile calling. Yeah, and the athletic director is now a CEO, business kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, football coaches. Coach Broy said one time if you're coaching past 50, then you're going to die as a football coach. You, that you, you, and he got out at 52, and so did Coach Royal. But, but in today's world, those guys are making so much money. Everybody in the SEC West, 17, all the football coaches are making four million and up. <laughs> it's pr pretty hard to walk away from that at 65 or 70 or whatever you. But, but the athletic director is a different kind of guy these days. He's a businessman, understand fundraising, motivating. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the, the Arkansas sports journalism fraternity. Did it get too close to Coach Broyles? Well, I don't know whether whether too close, but but back in the day, uh, Orville first place Orville Henry the Gazette Orville convinced uh, Frank 
that he could reach everybody in the state, and they could. At that time, the Gazette uh, was, the, was the dominant newspaper and did reach everybody in the state. And so Coach Sproles worked with him, but back in the early 60s, Orville would go down to Central Flying Service on Sunday, pick up Frank, they'd have lunch together at Frankie's, and then he'd go, Frank would go do the, uh, the uh, Razorback recap show. Yeah, did, was Orville too close to him? Yeah, probably so, but they, they helped each other. It was a collaborative kind of effort. There. Yeah, it was really. kind of a synergy, we'll, we'll call probably, it yeah, that. It's and, to, yeah. and finally, well, you, you had a personal, an intensely personal moment with Coach Broyles involving a member of your family. Uh, yeah, that was the kind of thing that uh, I was I started not to write about that the other day, and I thought well, maybe it does show what kind of guy. If, uh, this is, my son was 10 years old playing quarterback, got hurt, and North Rock doctor told him, you've got to have knee surgery. Coach Broyles found out about it and said, don't, don't do that. Bring him up here to Fayetteville, let our doctors look at him. We took him up there and the doctor said, believe me, if he has the kind of surgery, if he has the kind of injury they say he does, he's making medical history. Don't, don't do this. Walked in on crutches, walked out on his own, getting ready for a follow-up exam, and Coach Broyles got, he didn't call me personally, but he got word to me, don't worry about coming to Fayetteville, we're going to play in Little Rock, and you just come and bring him down there and the doctor will look at him. And it turns out this is the day they're playing Texas A&M for the Southwest Conference Championship for the Cotton Bowl, and my son's in the dressing room with their coach, I mean with their, with their doctor, being treated by the same guy who's going to tape athletes here in two hours. And I never got a bill for it. My wife and I talked about it the other day after he died. I don't think we ever got a bill for it. Now, is that over the line? I'd like to think I was down the middle, uh, but I do remember that. Harry King, thanks very much. You bet. Thanks very much. You bet, Steve. We'll be back in just a moment. Back now with our panel and some of the week's other news. Sarah White's Coda Check joins us from Arkansas Public Media. Hoyt Purvis, columnist for the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Steve Brauner, and independent journalist. Uh, Steve, let's begin with Trump. Obviously, it was the major. He sucked all the oxygen out of the room for the basically the whole year. But uh, our peg, I guess, basically are two in Arkansas. One, and that's the decision by Walmart to put some distance between... Uh, well, it no longer even exists, the business panel, and also the uh, quiet reaction, by and large, from Arkansas Republicans to the uh, Trump Tower outburst. Well, we had, you know, the, the president's three statements, three sets of statements on the Charlottesville uh, events, and at first, uh, Walmart CEO Doug McMillan uh, said that, you know, we Walmart condemns, or not condemns, but backs away from uh, these statements, but we're going to stay on this council that, that he was a part of, this business advisory council for President Trump. But as other CEOs began to, to distance themselves and began to drop off, uh, the CEOs of Merck, Under Armour, Campbell's Soup, and some others, uh, basically uh, the, pre the president just disbanded them. So now those don't exist. That kind of gets uh, Walmart out of a bind uh, because uh, you know this is a national company, an international company. Uh, doesn't want to be involved in that kind of politics. At the same time, doesn't want to offend the president of the United States. So by disbanding them, it kind of got them out of a bind. Now, still in a bind are Arkansas's political leaders, most of whom did come out and expressed uh, disappointment in uh, the president's uh, kind of muddled responses. Uh, some of them more strong disapproval than others. It's a tough uh, balancing act for them because, number one, there, there is an outcry about the president's back and forth on that issue. At the same time, there are still many Arkansans who um, like President Trump and thought his, at least his initial response, was totally okay. So they're, they're in a difficult situation. Nevertheless, most of, the, most of Arkansas political leaders did come out and express some disappointment in what the president said. Yeah. I mean, just I, maybe a slightly different take on uh, Walmart, Doug McMillan, the, the CEO, um, I thought uh, that was a very significant development because basically, uh, and you can say, well, you know, that Walmart needed to do it because, but the, the point is uh, Walmart generally has steered a very narrow course when it comes to politics. 
except on things that directly impact Walmart. This was more in the nature of a statement of principle, I thought, and a, and a very good one. And I, um, I think it, it sort of helped set the, the tone. Uh, on the one hand, you could say, well, Macmillan was following what some of the others did. But on the other hand, you could say that some of the others were following what, uh, what Walmart and Macmillan did. So I, I think it, uh, in, the, in the history of Walmart, I, I would rank that as a rather significant development. And of course, it, it underlined the point that um, Trump uh, seems to, in some respects, be more identified with these fringe racist groups than the, the, the top drawer uh, business leaders in the country. Well, that which raises the question, Sarah, Steve, Hoyt, anyone, how fine, how narrow a line, a, a rope, do Arkansas Republican leaders, are they walking? Yeah, I just, I, I, again, uh, Senator Cotton um, now they all endorsed made, him, made an interesting person. statement uh, for him, given the fact that in some ways he's been rather closely identified with Trump. Uh, just recently we had the, the introduction of the, of the immigration uh, legislation. But um, I, I thought Cotton, while not directly mentioning uh, the president, uh, made a, a, rather, a rather strong statement, and as have some of the other uh, Arkansas political leaders. How big is the base today, Steve, Sarah, anyway, in Arkansas? Nationally, it's usually at about a third of the electorate. The, which, Mr. Trump's base. Well, has it I mean, shrunk any? Has it cost him much? How I mean, much has it cost him Well, much? in a recent talk business poll, and this all occurred before uh, the Charlottesville events, uh, his approval rating had gone from 60 to 50. Um, but it's, at the same point, there's going to be a floor to it. There's going to be a percentage of people who, who support him uh, until the end. DYS, the Division of Youth Services. We've got to move along. Uh, the Hutchinson administration announced this week, this past week, that it's outsourcing youth services. Uh, this is the second time in, like, the last 15 years, uh, Steve, that, Sarah, that this has been done. Well, uh, in 2016, the state was unable to complete a contracting process with a group of nonprofits and an outside bidder. The nonprofits had been running the services for decades. And since then, when the state, as a result, took over, there have been issues reported about uh, the process of getting services going through the procurement through the state, a delay in mental health services and just basic provisions. And the governor came out and said that the DYS has made huge progress and that things are going well. But the reason they're going for an outside bid again is that they think that a contractor can be more efficient. So it's not clear entirely, you know, what's evolved in that line. But going to reopen the bid and have a clear process, clear criteria for what they're looking for from providers. Yeah, Steve. Well, not to mention high-profile escapees. Um, government does hard things, and this is among the hardest. You know, what do you do with young people who presumably are not at the age where they're completely responsible for their actions, and yet their actions have been, you know, crimes? Yeah. What do you do with that? They need to be educated. They need to be brought into a different place in society. But it's, it's very difficult. It's very expensive. You know, the failure rate's pretty high. Um, so we're going back and forth a little bit, trying to figure out the best way. Uh, I mean, how do you experiment with this? It's just an extremely difficult situation. And so there's a, going to be a review, and there's going to be, you know, back to a privatization of who runs the facilities. It's, it's, it's difficult, and it's always going to be difficult. Is this a fiscally driven decision? The last time, the outside bid was about twice as much as what the nonprofit had been, the nonprofits had been charging the state. So that kind of opens the question, would an outside private company charge considerably more than the state could do the job? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the larger question of, of outsourcing, it, it's been, I don't want to say the vogue, but it's been the vogue in some quarters anyway in the last really quarter century that functions normally, traditionally assigned or shouldered by government turned over to the private sector. Sometimes it works, Hoyt, sometimes it doesn't. Well, uh, this, Or disappoints anyway. <laughs> what I'm going to say is not uh, followed directly on what you said, what you mentioned, but 
it, occur, it occurs to me uh, how far are we going to go with this because there's now serious discussion or has been within the Trump administration about uh, the, basically using private uh, military, military organizations uh, that, are, that are not directly a part of the U.S. government. So you're right. It Air has, traffic control. Yeah, it has been control. you know something that is increasingly evident uh, in, in the way government operates or uh, hands off the, the work to someone else. One uh, certain difference is that with access to public information, having a private entity running a public service, uh, it's harder in some ways to know what's happening with that organization. Well, we've had an experience also in recent history, anyway, where Department of Correction outsourced. Uh, the result did not satisfy the General Assembly, and as a matter of fact, the General Assembly wasn't terribly satisfied with the way DYS was administered when, when it was in private hands. The danger, of course, when you, when you create, make this kind of service profit-driven, then there becomes an interest in creating more of the service. And we don't want more, more prisoners unless it's just bad people going to jail. We, you know, you don't want there to be incentives for there to be more prisoners. And so that's the dangerous tightrope you walk with this. At the same time, sometimes the private sector does do things more efficiently than the public sector does, and that's, the, that's what you hope to accomplish with this. Another significant story of the past week involves Planned Parenthood and state Medicaid funding. Uh, the Honorable Judge Baker of the U.S. District Court, Eastern District, uh, for a second time enjoined the state from enforcing the uh, Hutchinson, Hutchinson administration's uh, directive forbidding any further Medicaid reimbursement. A second time, the Eighth Circuit has said, no, you overreached. So where does this thing stand now? Standing, literally, was, was the court's, uh, I think, initial problem, the Eighth Circuit's problem. Well, a couple of things to be said. One is that funding uh, was going to Planned Parenthood. I mean, that's the that's what's a, at issue here, and uh, the reality is I, this is not something that that was directly related to abortions. But Planned Parenthood sort of has a target is a target for for the the anti-abortion uh, groups, and so that that's really what this was about. I think. In addition, of course, from a legal standpoint. The question is, is this going to go to the Supreme Court uh, in some fashion or another? We have circuit courts of appeals in conflict. That usually is a, a fast track. That's usually a, a ticket to D.C. Well, the, but the Supreme Court also has, you know, is, is, is given choices of many, many right. cases to listen to. So it would seem like there would be a need to do this, but at the same time, there's only nine justices. They're not getting any younger. <laughs> and it's only so much work they can do. Yeah, the question is whether they can get four if there's an appeal yeah. up there. Yeah. Some final words on Coach Broyles. Hoy, uh, I guess with the exception of you, he was coach, uh, was, the, was the public face of the University of Arkansas for some idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but we, got to, we have to mention, and Hoyt, uh, Hoyt mentioned this earlier, something that we didn't cover with Harry King. It was Frank Broyles who opened the door to so many other sports. At Fayetteville. Yeah, I, I thought uh, what Harry had to say was, was very good, uh, and he certainly uh, knows uh, the Broyles story very well. But one thing that I think really uh, should be mentioned is, is the fact that as athletic director, beyond his football coaching, but as athletic director, he had a great deal to do with putting in place very strong programs for other sports, notably basketball, baseball, and particularly track and field. And I think that's something that uh, uh, certainly ranks among the contributions that Frank Bros made. And, and the expansion and facilities up there is Absolutely. just mind-boggling yes. in, in, in one lifetime. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's uh, for anybody who, who hasn't uh, been there in a few years, it's stunning just to see uh, what the uh, sports facilities are now for intercollegiate sports. But women participate as well at to an extent never seen before. And that wasn't all of, co of uh, uh, Coach Broyles doing, of course. It, the NCAA had a lot to do with it, and even, even the Congress had something to right. do with it. Yeah, but, well, certainly, uh, we've, I mean, if you wanted to talk about dramatic changes that have occurred over the past couple of decades, the uh, increasing prominence of, of women's sports at the collegiate level would rank very high. 
Hoyt, what kind of figure was he on campus? I mean, he was always, he was an executive. He was a manager, certainly, in the, in the second half of his career at Fayetteville. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Coach Brawls, if I can <laughs> use that name, uh, w was someone who always seemed to have uh, a close relationship with the uh, upper administration at the university and the trustees, and uh, that that was important in a number of ways. And and again, one of the things that's often mentioned is the fact that, for example, he was very supportive of the uh, library expansion, uh, the books campaign of some years ago, and also uh, w was uh, involved in in directing some of the. Uh, some of the revenue uh, generated by uh, sports, particularly TV, uh, toward uh, the, the more pure educational functions yeah. of the university. Slide this one in at the very late because we're about out of time. <clears throat> With all due respect to everyone involved, was it more a case of the university's administrators trying to stay close to Coach Broyles? He was a power center. <laughs> no so. doubt about it. He was, he was someone who had clout and uh, that clout was very far-reaching. And part of that, of course, due to, to one of the things that Harry mentioned, the fact that he was instrumental in developing the statewide identification with the Razorbacks. Got to leave it there. We're out of time. Thanks to everybody for coming in. As always, thanks to you for watching. And we'll see you next week. Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.